looking out for snowfall amounts. A lot of places getting right around to 12 inches of snow. Any kind of clouds we have across northern areas this morning giving way to sunshine. Which the, the allergy rest. index is definitely on the rise. As a jet stream kicks this mild stuff out of here and drives in the heat. Arctic air is pouring in from Canada. Morning commute if you live in York, Cumberland County. Plan for some slow goings. And you're talking See, wind chill readings in the single digits above and below zero. We get Thursday beyond. with high pressure, full control of our forecast. It'll be sunny. Remnants of Alex over Mexico, more showers and thunderstorms across the Gulf Coast states. No big storms, though, on the seven-day forecast. I'm going to get bored in the old weather office here. Today's podcast is about collecting weather data. Hi, everyone. Lisa here. Weather forecasts are an important part of our lives. They help us decide how to dress every day. They help airports determine when to alter flight paths around storms. They help farmers determine when to plant. They let schools know when to give us snow days. Tracking the weather is an important job. It's also fun to do. This pile of plastic and cords you see here is actually an electronic weather station. When it's installed properly, this one will be capable of measuring temperature and humidity, my favorite, wind speed and direction, as well as air pressure. Now equipment like this is fine for collecting weather data in your own backyard or on the school grounds, but what about the data that's used to make daily forecasts or to track climate? How is that data collected? Well, if you come with me, we can go take a look. I'm here at Kingman Farm in Madbury, New Hampshire, and I'm standing in front of a real genuine NOAA weather station. NOAA stands for the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, in case you were wondering. This weather station is one of many in the United States that collects weather data every day. The data they collect helps create weather forecasts and track climate changes. You can see weather stations on top of buildings, in the country, and in cities, at airports large and small, in remote undisturbed areas. There are thousands of stations like these all across the country. Maybe you've seen one and just didn't realize what it was. Now that you know what one looks like, you can keep a lookout for them. In fact, the next time you get a chance, go online and see if you can find the weather station that's closest to where you live or go to school. The NOAA.gov website would be a great place to start looking. Now not all weather stations are exactly the same and there's some different ways they can collect data. Let's take a look at a couple of the different types of stations and their equipment. Some weather stations are monitored by trained volunteers from the National Weather Service's Cooperative Observer Program or the co-op program. There are over 10,000 of these volunteers across the United States who take daily readings of one or more weather factors such as high and low temperatures, rainfall, snowfall, and snow depth. They record the information and then submit it to their local National Weather Service stations by mail, telephone, or internet. Volunteers have been collecting weather data for 200 years. This data is very important to our meteorologists in making the daily weather forecasts we see on TV or online. At these stations, you'll often see traditional style thermometers housed in a shelter like you see here. When the surrounding air gets warmer, the liquid inside the thermometer heats up too. It expands and rises up the tube. As the surrounding air cools, the liquid inside the thermometer cools too. It contracts and goes back down. More modern cooperative observer stations have an electronic thermometer inside a smaller shelter like this one. The thermometer communicates with a display unit from which the observer records the temperature. Traditional style rain gauges collect liquid precipitation in some sort of tube. For rain gauges like this one, the volunteer has to come and measure how much precipitation has collected in the tube and overflow area. There are also mechanical rain gauges. They work by collecting a certain amount of water until its weight causes the mechanism inside to trigger a recording device of some kind. The more modern co-op stations use sensors and data loggers to measure and record rainfall amounts. Data are collected very differently at stations like this one here at Kingman Farm. These stations are fully automated and require little or no attention from humans. At automated stations, data are collected by a series of sensors. They're called sensors because like our senses, like our eyes, nose, ears, mouth, and skin, they sense their environment. When our senses take in information, they send it to our brains, which processes it and tells us what to do. For example, if I touch a hot stove, my brain gets the message and tells me to pull my hand away. There are different sensors for measuring different aspects of the weather. This picture shows a complete automated system found at an airport in the United States. 
In this setup, there are sensors for measuring wind speed and wind direction, the amount of precipitation, the type of precipitation, air temperature and humidity, the height of the clouds, and visibility. The electronic sensors at automated weather stations convert the information they receive from the environment into electrical signals that are translated into numbers and transferred to a database to be stored and used any time. In recent years, some of these automated stations have been updated to allow their sensors to transmit their data to satellites orbiting the Earth, making it available almost instantly on the Internet. These automated stations are collecting data 24 hours a day, every single day of the year. So we have the co-op observers sending their data to their local National Weather Service offices, and these automated stations are doing the same thing. But what happens with all this data? Well, it's this data that our local weather forecasters use to create our forecasts. Now, of course, no human could possibly handle all this data by themselves. So they have high-speed computers and special computer programs that help them make sense of it all. Surely we don't go through all this trouble collecting all this data just to make a single local weather forecast. What happens to all that data afterwards? That is a good question. The National Weather Service stations transmit their data to the National Climatic Data Center, or the NCDC, which is also part of NOAA. This data is stored in NCDC databases long term. Other countries contribute to this data as well. This allows us to track climate changes globally. Long-term weather and climate data for over a hundred years are available to scientists anywhere in the world. And it's available to you as well. Well, that does it for this podcast. I hope you enjoyed learning about how weather data is collected. Until next time, enjoy exploring our systems. I think I'm going to go explore some of the trails I saw on my way in here. If you enjoyed this podcast, check out the others in our series by visiting mmsa.org slash e-a-s-i-e. The EASY Project is a Maine Mathematics and Science Alliance initiative funded by the NOAA Environmental Literacy Program for K-12 education. National Weather... I'll keep going. And of course, like, it's not <laughs> Always the wind when we don't want it. Ah! I got prickers on me! <laughs> how do I get them off? You know, this is how they developed, got the idea for Velcro.